My name is Raul Franco, and my partner Christian Peterson and I will be discussing hyperparathyroidism. First, we'll start with the definition. Hyperparathyroidism is due to increased activity of the parathyroid glands, whether from an intrinsic abnormal change altering excretion of parathyroid hormone, or from an extrinsic abnormal change affecting calcium homeostasis, stimulating production of parathyroid hormone. Clinical findings of hyperparathyroidism are osteoporosis, kidney stones, excessive urination, abdominal pain, tiring easily or weakness, depression or forgetfulness, bone and joint pain, or frequent complaints of illness with no apparent cause. Some clinical factoids are that 70 to 80 percent of patients with primary hyperparathyroidism have no obvious symptoms or signs of disease. Most diagnoses are found through routine blood work. In 20 to 30 percent of symptomatic patients, nephrolithiasis is the most common symptom, followed by overt skeletal disease, hypercalciuria, and neuromuscular symptoms, depression, dementia, confusion, and stupor. 85 percent of patients with primary hyperparathyroidism have a single adenoma. Moving on to radiographic findings of primary and secondary hyperparathyroidism. Many studies have determined that there are different clinical radiographic signs that appear during the disease process. What has been found are multiple different areas being affected, including an increased incidence of tori, reduction of cortical bone, and increased PDL width. We will be describing these findings using the acronym LESION. L. Tori more likely show up on the lingual surface of the mandible in patients with primary hyperparathyroidism. Radicular lamina is also involved, as well as the periodontal ligament space, cortical bone, and angle of the mandible. E. Edge of the tori, the radicular lamina, and PDL space are well defined, while the radicular lamina, cortical bone, and angle of the mandible are ill defined. S. Shape of the lesions depend on their location. The tori are round and ovoid. The PDL follows the shape of the teeth, and the mandible locations involved show generalized radiolucency. I. Internal. Tori internal aspects are radiopaque like bone, PDL, cortical bone, radicular lamina, and angle of the mandible are radiolucent. O. Other. The tongue may be displaced slightly due to the size of the mandibular tori. The teeth may become involved due to the enlargement of the PDL and the inferior alveolar nerve could become involved by the decreasing density of the mandible. N. Number. The number depends on the extent of the disease process. S. Size. Size of the lesions also depends on the extent of the disease process. Moving on to radiographic findings of tertiary hyperparathyroidism. Tertiary hyperparathyroidism usually presents radiographically, similar to advanced secondary hyperparathyroidism. However, the characteristic findings are not always what appear clinically, which leaves room for alternative findings. We reference a case report from the Journal of Clinical Imaging Science, where a 59-year-old man presented with a brown tumor. So located in the left maxillary sinus, the edge is well-defined. The shape is round and spreads into adjacent bony fossa. Internal unilocular radiolucent lesion. Other structures involved include the floor of the orbit, infratemporal fossa, nasal cavity, pterygopalatine fossa, and premaxilla. This is a single expansal lesion with a size of 38 by 46 by 68 millimeters measured by CT scan. Next we'll move on to the differential interpretation. Uh, the first and most likely differential interpretation is primary hyperparathyroidism. Uh, in 75 to 85 percent of the cases, there's a single gland adenoma that is the cause. Uh, two glands in 2 to 12 percent. Uh, in less than 1 to 2 percent of cases, three glands are the cause, and all four glands are the cause in about 1 to 15 percent of cases. Uh, pri primary hyperparathyroidism can be excluded, though, if an adenoma is not present or detected. Uh, or if the elevated levels of parathyroid hormone are due to the failure 
of one of the components of calcium homeostasis. The second differential diagnosis is familial benign hypocalciuric hypercalcemia. Uh, in 9% of patients referred to the National Institute of Health for failed parathyroidectomies, uh, this was the underlying cause. Uh, it has the signs of hyperparathyroidism with hypercalcemia, uh, and it also has increased levels of parathyroid hormone. Um, however, it can be excluded from the list of differential diagnoses if there is mention of nephrolithiasis or kidney stones, uh, if there are multiple skeletal pathologic changes, and if a family history of hypercalcemia does not exist. The third differential will be secondary hyperparathyroidism. Uh, this is considered if no adenoma is present and uh, there is no family history of hypercalcemia. Uh, there are several different causes of secondary hyperparathyroidism, including celiac disease, vitamin D deficiencies, uh, chronic kidney disease, and many others. Um, this can be excluded as a differential, though, if there is no adenoma present, leading to a diagnosis of primary hyperparathyroidism, or if there is a history of familial hypercalcemia. The final differential is tertiary hyperparathyroidism, which uh, is due to prolonged secondary hyperparathyroidism. Uh, it can be included if there is a lack of suppression of parathyroid hormone with increasing calcium or vitamin D clinically. Uh, also, if brown tumors are found, this should be suspected, as we mentioned previously, in the case report. Uh, however, it can be excluded if secondary hyperparathyroidism was never an option or if an adenoma is found clinically which could be causing primary hyperparathyroidism. It can also be excluded if there is a family history of hypercalcemia. Next, we'll talk about the treatment of primary hyperparathyroidism. Uh, the most common form of treatment is a total parathyroidectomy, which is the removal of all normal and accessory parathyroid glands. Uh, however, there's another type uh, called a minimal in minimally invasive parathyroidectomy, uh, where the parathyroid adenomas are removed. Uh, however, this requires preoperative detection methods such as ultrasounds, MRIs, and CT scans. Uh, treatment of secondary hyperparathyroidism. Um, effective treatment will rely on figuring out exactly what is causing the hyperactive parathyroid function. Like we talked about earlier, this could be to a chronic kidney disease, celiac disease, uh, vitamin D deficiencies, and so on. Uh, the treatment will be as simple as supplementing additional vitamin D or taking calcium mimetics, uh, or starting to phosphonate medication. Treatment of tertiary hyperparathyroidism uh, it normally involves a total parathyroidectomy. Uh, however, you can also use medicaments such as calcium carbonate, vitamin D, aluminum hydroxide antacids, uh, lanthanum carbonate, uh, cevelimer, and most commonly uh, calcium emetics. Finally, we'll go over the key points of our presentation. Uh, people with hyperparathyroidism are more likely to have tori and reductions in radicular lamina dura on dental radiographs, as well as widening of the PDL space surrounding the teeth correlated with serum PTH levels. Uh, panoramic radiographs also demonstrated reduced cortical bone thickness at the angle of the mandible in hyperparathyroid patients. The best treatment option for primary hyperparathyroidism is surgical removal of a parathyroid adenoma. A total or subtotal parathyroidectomy is the recommended treatment for tertiary hyperparathyroidism. The best treatment for secondary hyperparathyroidism is the use of medications such as calcium emetics or supplementation with vitamin D. Uh, hormone replacement therapy is common in treating postmenopausal women to stabilize their bone density levels as well. And when chronic renal failure exists, leading to secondary hyperparathyroidism, dialysis, and calcium emetics are the best treatment options. In general, hyperparathyroidism will result in decreased bone density, cortical bone loss, increased PDL width, and a higher incidence of mandibular tori. The lesions will appear radiolucent due to decreased density caused by increased osteoclastic activity from increased levels of parathyroid hormone. The best treatment option for primary hyperparathyroidism is parathyroidectomy, whether that be complete or minimally invasive. The best treatment for secondary and tertiary are medicaments including calcium emetics, dysphosphonates, 
hormone replacement therapy, and supplements to correct mineral and vitamin deficiencies.